I name this ship Karenia. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Down the ways goes another great liner destined to carry on the unbeatable tradition of British ships and their builders. More than 700 feet long, the Coronia had the lines and beauty of a yacht. In 1910, a 31-year-old son of a shipping magnate from Wavertree, Liverpool, became a director at the Cunard Line. By 1922, he was elevated to deputy director, and by 1930, he became chairman when the company was in the midst of a crisis brought on by the Great Depression. Sir Percy Ellie Bates was a decisive leader with strong connections to the British Admiralty and the royal family. With this company on the verge of collapse, he deftly negotiated a merger with Cunard's longtime rival, the White Star Line. He leveraged his connections to ensure that Cunard would remain on top, with two-thirds control of the newly formed Cunard White Star Line. With Cunard's greatest rival out of the way, Bates now had the resources he needed to bring his vision to reality. A pair of great superliners, larger than any other ship in the world and fast enough to operate a weekly transatlantic service with just two ships. A master of communications, Bates knew that the race to attain and hold the Blue Ribbon would earn headlines for years. He would build on Cunard's relationship with the royal family by naming these premier liners after the royals, starting with the Queen of the United Kingdom at the time, Mary of Tech. This also further tied the company with British identity at a time when nationalism was at an all-time high. The RMS Queen Mary was launched on September 26, 1934, and construction soon began on her running mate, the RMS Queen Elizabeth. Both ships would earn the company massive profits, and they would prove vital assets to the Allies during World War II, which would claim the life of Bates' only child, Edward Percy, who was killed in Germany in 1945 while serving as a pilot officer in the Royal Air Force. Despite personal tragedy, Sir Percy Bates always kept an eye on the future, and seeing trouble for his industry brewing just after the war, he began looking for a long-term solution. In the 1930s, both Cunard and the White Star Line experimented with offering cruises on some of their second-tier ships. Even when operating these voyages in tropical ports using ships designed primarily for the North Atlantic, pleasure cruising showed promise. Bates recognized that advancements in aeronautics made during the war would eventually revolutionize civilian transportation. Decisive action was needed if the company was going to stay ahead through the second half of the 20th century. As the war came to an end, Bates initiated the company's first post-war building project. He envisioned a great dual-purpose liner. She would be fast and powerful enough to supplement the company's premier transatlantic routes, but from the keel up, every aspect of her design would be tailored to cruising. Bates recognized what the future held for his company, and he was ready to act decisively to maintain Cunard's dominance, even if the transatlantic passenger trade turned to the sky. But then, on October 14, 1946, with the keel of his visionary new liner having only been laid a few months prior, Sir Percy Bates suffered a massive heart attack in his office. He died two days later at the age of 67, leaving the Cunard line without the vision and leadership that had shepherded the company through its greatest challenges as an existential threat loomed on the horizon. In the aftermath of World War II, the Cunard Line found itself in a strange position. War losses were limited to just a handful of secondary ships like the Lancastria and the Laconia. But all of the company's premier liners, including Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, survived. The Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth easily lived up to the vision Sir Percy Bates had for them in the early 1930s. After extensive refits that restored their passenger configurations, the Queen Elizabeth, completed during the war, was able to enter passenger service and the Queen Mary was able to resume her already wildly successful career. The burned out hull of her greatest rival, the SS Normandy, was being scrapped in New Jersey and other rivals like Bremen and Rex met similar fates. Virtually unchallenged, the two queens quickly began generating massive profits for the Cunard line, 
which dropped White Star from its name in 1949. And the company was able to coast through the 1950s on the investments made by Bates almost two decades prior. By the time of his passing in October 1946, the liner that represented his vision for the future was well into construction. Designated hall number 635 and laid down on February 13, 1946, this new ship was constructed by Cunard's longtime partner, the John Brown and Company Shipyard in Clydebank, Scotland. The years immediately after the war proved challenging for the shipyard, but a major contract like the one for Coronia helped keep the yard in business, but costly overages prevented any profits. Post-war material shortages and labor disputes presented major issues throughout her construction. Special permission had to be granted to import materials like her teak decking, and she went months over her original summer 1948 delivery date. Her original fixed rate contract was for 3.4 million pounds, but these excessive delays pushed her final price to 5.3 million pounds, nearly 2 million over budget. Now led by Sir Percy Bates's brother, Frederick Bates, Cunard's leadership was horrified by the ballooning costs, but most remained confident in the project, recalling the enormous debt incurred by the company while recovering their fleet losses after World War I, debt that was easily repaid in the 1920s. Now in an even stronger position, it seemed inevitable that the company would easily recoup the losses and Coronia would quickly build a loyal following. Her design language echoed Cunard's Queens and the second Mauritania, built just before the war, but her hull took on a more yacht-like appearance, with a dramatic clipper bow and a massive single funnel, the largest ever installed on a liner at that time. She was painted in four different shades of green, a color that made her instantly recognizable and helped keep her interiors cool in tropical destinations. She quickly earned the nickname, the Green Goddess. As built, she came in at 34,183 tons, with a length of 715 feet or 218 meters, and a beam of just over 91 feet or 28 meters. She had twin screws powered by geared turbines that generated 35,000 shaft horsepower, achieving a 22 knot service speed. Cunard's close relationship with the royal family was as strong as ever after World War II, and Coronia was the largest passenger ship launched since the war. To mark the occasion, Princess Elizabeth was invited to christen the new liner in her last public appearance before her marriage three weeks later to Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. The future queen launched Coronia in a massive ceremony on October 30, 1947. Over the next year, she was outfitted with interiors fit for the wealthy passengers she would soon carry all over the world. Out in the open sea, the great ship becomes a world apart, a smooth sailing, air-conditioned world. RMS Coronia sailed her maiden voyage from Southampton to New York on January 4, 1949. During her first few years of service, she spent the majority of the year sailing transatlantic crossings while demand was high. In the winter months, she would offer cruises. On transatlantic voyages, she was given a two-class configuration with accommodations for 581 first-class passengers and 351 cabin-class passengers. On cruises, she would be converted to an all-first-class configuration, accommodating a maximum of 650 passengers. Her designers were keenly aware that she would carry ultra-wealthy passengers on world cruises that could last up to 100 days or more. Because of this, she was given extra spacious cabins, and in a rarity for the time, every single cabin was outfitted with full bathrooms and showers, something not even Cunard's queens had at the time. She was outfitted with a carrier air conditioning system throughout her passenger spaces, and she was given a large outdoor swimming pool. Her interior spaces featured a subdued mid-century version of Art Deco, similar to those found on the pre-war Cunarders, but ever so slightly updated. Her first-class cabins came in a variety of designs and were outfitted with fine furnishings. 150 were decorated with unique veneers featuring rare woods like flame maple, mazar birch, and white sycamore. Like both Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, Coronia featured an observation lounge in her forward superstructure. This curved room offered large windows with striking views and was paneled in a powder blue plastic with German silver trim, all centered around a large curved bar. 
Her grand staircase featured wood veneers with German silver trim details and cozy leather seating. In keeping with her one-class cruise configuration, all of her main passenger staircases kept a matching design scheme. A centerpiece of the ship was her lounge, paneled in Canadian maple, primavera, and soprano veneer. The huge double-height room was lit with concealed fluorescent lighting and featured a massive painting of Princess Elizabeth and the Duke of Edinburgh, a gift suggested by Princess Elizabeth herself, who took a great interest in the ship and cherished her involvement. The painting was not ready in time for her maiden voyage, so for her first few trips, a signed photograph was hung in its stead. The room also featured a large silver and gold lacquer and gesso art piece by F.H. Coventry, depicting a forest and wild horses. Her two main dining rooms were designed to easily accommodate both a two-class and one-class configuration. Balmoral, the restaurant designed for first class on transatlantic voyages, could seat 280 passengers. It was decorated with a quilted birch and corbel veneer and featured more art and metalwork by F.H. Coventry. Roughly equal in size, Sandringham served cabin class passengers on transatlantic voyages and first class on cruises. Paneled in Paldau, ash, and eucalyptus burr, the room featured etched mirror panels representing each of the four seasons. These panels were illuminated from their edges, highlighting their designs. At the center of the room was another mirrored panel depicting Apollo and the Sun Chariot by artist John Hutton. Her distinctive first-class smoking room was paneled in figured walnut and decorated with small golden bronze plaques representing the signs of the zodiac. The room was topped with a 12-sided golden ceiling, with panels representing each of the 12 months. It was furnished with red, brown, and gold hide, accompanied by walnut accent tables. With the crew capacity of just around 600, most cruises offered a greater than one-to-one -one crew to passenger ratio. Cunard spared no expense building Coronia, sure that their lavish spending would endure the new ship to a wealthy and exclusive class of travelers. After her first handful of transatlantic crossings, Coronia would embark on her first cruise from New York to the Caribbean, and Cunard would soon find out if they had just made a terrible investment. RMS Coronia was ahead of her time in almost every way, and the traveling public immediately took notice. She was instantly one of Cunard's most popular liners. In her early years, when demand was highest, she spent most of the year operating transatlantic voyages and operated cruises only in the winter. She sailed her first world cruise in 1951. The voyage was a hit, and by 1952, her schedule was almost entirely devoted to cruises only sailing a handful of transatlantic crossings in August and September. She typically started each year with a three-month-long world cruise originating from New York. Some cruises would last even longer, going 100 days or more. In 1953, Coronia celebrated Queen Elizabeth's coronation with what was dubbed the Coronation Cruise, one of her most well-known and memorable voyages. Cunard was known to rotate crew amongst their liners somewhat frequently during this period, and only the best were selected to serve on Coronia. Positions on the ship were highly sought after. Her cruises offered a calmer and more refined atmosphere than the schedule-driven slog on the transatlantic liners. Coronia visited ports all over the world, many of which were a first for a Cunard liner, and it offered crew a unique opportunity to see the world. Plus, vacationing millionaires were fairly generous with their tips. While she was a pleasure to work on, she proved tricky to maneuver, especially in high winds, which would catch her massive funnel. She was surprisingly significantly less agile than the Queens, which were both more than double her size. In 1952, she ran aground in the Suez Canal. Then, in 1956, she did the same thing in Messina. Both times resulted in minimal damage, and she was refloated the next day. But her most serious accident occurred on a world cruise in 1958, when she was leaving the harbor of Yokohama. As she maneuvered around a U.S. Navy vessel, she was caught in high winds that sent the liner into the harbor's breakwater, significantly damaging her bow and demolishing a harbor lighthouse. Coronia stopped sailing regularly scheduled transatlantic voyages in 1959 when, say it with me, air travel rapidly became the preferred way to cross the Atlantic. Her schedule was now devoted to cruising throughout the year as Cunard faced a steep drop in passenger numbers. As the 1960s progressed, 
the highly profitable company was now bleeding money. Coronia was one of the only profitable ships still operating in their fleet. But like so much else, the 1960s made the once glamorous Coronia feel dated as other companies launched new ships with numerous innovations geared toward the cruise market. Cunard desperately made a series of updates to other liners like the Mauritania II, Franconia, Kermania, and the Queen Elizabeth in an attempt to offer more cruises and match the success of Coronia, but these had only mixed results. In an attempt to keep Coronia competitive, a major refit was carried out in November of 1965 that installed new passenger suites, a new Lido deck, and other extensive interior renovations to refresh the aging liner. But the Siemens strike of 1966 in Britain hit the company hard and upset many of Coronia's planned itineraries. 1967 was the first year Coronia failed to generate a profit. Facing a dire financial situation, Cunard put Coronia up for sale that year, and she sailed her final voyage with the company, one last transatlantic crossing from New York to Southampton. From here, it gets pretty sad. In 1968, she was sold to a company called Star Shipping. By this point, maintenance had lagged. Her new owners carried out some work and renamed her the SS Columbia and then the Caribbea. She was given an all-white paint scheme and sent to New York in 1969 where she would offer budget cruises to the Caribbean. She suffered a number of mechanical failures, and on only her second cruise, an engine room explosion killed one crew member and severely scalded another. The ship lost all power for 20 hours before finally limping back to New York. This would prove to be her final commercial voyage. Over the next five years, plans for a revival came and went until finally her owners threw in the towel and sold her for scrapping at a breaker in Taiwan in 1974. Unable to sail under her own power, she would be towed from New York by a German tug called the Hamburg. By the time she made it to Honolulu, she nearly capsized, but she was finally righted and the voyage sailed forward. Right into Typhoon Mary, a Category 5 Super Typhoon. On August 12th, near Guam, the Hamburg's generators failed. Her crew was forced to cut their tow lines to save their own ship, and Coronia was set adrift. She eventually wrecked on a breakwater at Abra Harbor, her wreck blocked the entrance to the vital harbor, making it impossible to resupply the island of Guam with commercial or military vessels. Her wreck would have to be removed immediately. But complicating the matter, she came to rest right beside the wreck of a Korean War landing craft loaded with munitions. The wreck of one of the most innovative liners of her time was quickly and carefully cut up and fully removed by the end of 1975. Coronia represented what could have been if the Cunard line continued to build for the future once Sir Percy Bates' leadership came to an end. She was one of the first purpose-built cruise ships and perhaps the Cunard liner best suited for the changing market before they finally built the Queen Elizabeth II. Instead, the company cashed in on the wise investments made before the war and coasted through the 1950s. Some at the company thought air travel would be just another passing fad, but most knew what was on the horizon. They lacked Percy Bates's vision and decisiveness. If it wasn't for that complacency, Cunard could have defined the cruise industry we know today. Instead, they nearly collapsed. Passengers and crew loved the Coronia. She was the best that Cunard had to offer at a time when the company was at its peak. It was an era when a world cruise was not only an escape from day-to-day -day life, but an exciting adventure. Long before tourism flooded the world's landmarks, a voyage on the Coronia was an experience you would remember for the rest of your life. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked what you saw, help keep this channel afloat by liking, commenting, and hitting that old subscribe button for more stories like this one. I'd like to give a special shout out to my supporters on Patreon. I'm confident that they could have saved the Coronia. All right, crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people.